and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show where you can win big money or prizes. Actually, you can't. We just don't have that kind of budget. Hell, we can't even afford to give out pocket change and rejects from the skill crane in front of the Walmart right now. Anyway, it's been a while, so let's do that local TV thing again today. And uh, actually, this one's going to be a bit more of a history lesson than usual. So today, I want to tackle those once pervasive, truly penny ante time fillers, which just conveniently seem to be the same ones all across the country. I'm talking dialing for dollars, bowling for dollars, and TV pow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So don't forget now, rapping is the word. It'll be an Indianapolis call to the uh, 357 exchange, and I'll make the call right after you watch this. In the ongoing rush to fill airtime during the 50s to 80s, local TV stations across America were looking for any gimmick that would hopefully keep people tuned in. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the occasional entrepreneur stepped up to try and fill this void. The most famous slash infamous franchise concept was actually an old radio gimmick. In 1939, Baltimore's WCBM launched a little thing called Dialing for Dollars. The basic idea was that a host would randomly call people out of the local white pages, whereupon they could win a jackpot. Invariably, there'd be no one home. But if that random person happened to be home and picked up the phone, they would be asked about a specific bit of information that only active listeners would be aware of, like some random number or the day's jackpot amount. If that person knew the pertinent bit of info, they would win the jackpot. If there was no winner, some arbitrary dollar amount, usually corresponding to the station's spot on the dial, would be added to the pot. For example, if the station was on 6.60 a.m. and there was no winner that day, $6.60 would be added to the jackpot. Of course, given that winners were a little on the rare side, the jackpot could swell to some tidy amounts of money, sometimes into the four figures. Former WCBM disc jockey and longtime Dialing for Dollars host Jack Wells claimed responsibility for bringing the Dialing for Dollars concept to television in 1952. The earliest evidence I can find of any TV version of Dialing for Dollars comes from Buffalo, New York's WKBW from no earlier than late 1958. Nonetheless, the one constant is that the Dialing for Dollars concept was so thin that it couldn't carry an entire program. Instead, it was usually tied to some greater program like a talk show or a daytime airing of a movie or block of reruns, while Dialing for Dollars proper would be relegated to a segment. Hi, George L. back with a second phone call. This one worth uh, $90 if we can just find somebody to take the money. The dialing for dollars concept hit its peak during the 70s. Unfortunately, given that it was rarely recorded by the station, and given how new and expensive home video gear was at the time, footage from this period is sparse at best. My personal favorite surviving clip comes from an early open reel recording from New Haven, Connecticut's ABC affiliate, WTNH, from 1973. This edition bends the traditional formula by making the game segments an actual game, in which you or a live studio audience member picks a number from the game board with prizes under each number. This version also folds in an incredibly scattershot variety show. Keep an eye out for the world's best worst quasi operatic folk singer. Hello? Hello, is this the Cook residence? 
Yes, this is Mike Warren calling from Channel 8's Dialing for Dollars. May we speak to you on the air? Antoinette Cook, can we talk to you on, on the air? Okay, this is Antoinette Cook of Meriden, Connecticut, and uh, we have your card right here. We're ready to play the home lucky number game. What will be your first lucky number, please? Number eight. Okay, number eight. Oh. No, 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 hold it. Uh, no, 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 we start at the lower level. Oh. Yeah, 11 through 15. We almost had a tragedy here. Number 14. Number 14. Let's have a look under number 14. Nelson and... Oh, I don't believe it. Ah. Uh, I don't know what to say. This is the one I did for Joan Crawford recently. This second number is absolutely, uh, well, they're large pajama-like slacks with a uh, little uh, midriff uh, waist, and then you see the little hats. Now, these little Provence hats are kind of marvelous. We do them in every color, and uh, they're kind of great to wear in the summer, and they're very young, you see. we some of the boss's money through this afternoon, and I've got a rather sizable cash jackpot we'll try to give away right off the bat this afternoon. So off of the count board, we need to go. For the two things, hopefully you'll take a moment and write down. Today's count's going to be six from the bottom. Our first attempt at giving away cash this afternoon is worth $299. Amazingly, the dialing for dollars concept rolled into the 80s and 90s in some markets, complete with the original gameplay. More amazingly, a much reduced version still, as of this episode, lingers amongst the occasional local newscast, making this one of those super rare archivisms that's still a going concern, albeit very quietly. In 1953, Baltimore-based TV guru Burt Claster made history with the first significant franchise TV show, namely the cheapy kitty classic Romper Room. Lightning struck a second time for Claster Television with the usually five days a week Bowling for Dollars franchise, though that wasn't the original title. Bowling for Dollars originated in Baltimore as The Bowling Bank in 1967. The name was changed to Duck Pins and Dollars in 1968 to match the actual game, Duck Pins being a regional variant on traditional bowling involving some slightly smaller, more squatty looking pins. The earliest so-called Bowling for Dollars footage I've been able to find is of the original Duck Pins and Dollars, aired over Baltimore's WBAL circa 1969. As best as I can gather, the first actual Bowling for Dollars aired over Kansas City, Missouri's KMBC starting in 1970. Back on the regional thing, two other variants of the show ran over the years. The Canadian version of the show used that country's five-pin arrangement, and Candle Pins for Cash in Boston used New England's Candle Pin pins. We'll see what happens with one strike. The bowler and pin pal share $100. Here's that Midas muffler cap and scarf set that they each receive for one strike. And we're having a good time tonight. Let's keep it going. While the rules and dollar amounts varied from market to market, the most common rules and payoffs of bowling for dollars are as follows. Each contestant plays for themselves and an at-home pin pal who's chosen at random out of a pile of viewer-submitted cards. The contestant gets to take at least two shots. If the bowler can't hit all the pins in their two shots, they and their pin pal earn one dollar for each pin knocked down. If the bowler picks up a spare, they and their pin pal are given twenty dollars and one more shot, 
with either $1 per pin or $20 or some cheap prize if they get a strike. If the bowler gets a strike on their first shot, they and their pal are awarded $20. If the bowler gets two strikes in a row, they and their pal split the jackpot. Usually less than $1,000 total. Some versions of the game would allow for further prizes for third, fourth, and fifth consecutive strikes, including all expenses paid vacations and new cars. The pin pal doesn't get any of that stuff. Let's add 20 more dollars to the jackpot, bring it up to $140, and here's Marty Boyce of Rochester. Hello, Marty. Hi. Okay, do you do much bowling, do you? I work bowl at Steakhouse Lane. Oh, I see. Where do you work, Marty? In Danny, Texas Hot Lunch, 527 Central Avenue. Danny, Texas Hot Lunch. Hot Lunch. To me, the amusing thing about bowling for dollars is how repetitive it is. If you watch enough episodes, you know exactly which questions are going to be asked of the contestants during their pre-game interviews, which are invariably far longer than the actual gameplay. Evidently, some producers felt the same way, as this in-house Christmas reel from 1974 suggests that the show may as well have been hosted by a robot. Mike Jacker on. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Who'd you bring with you? Who'd you bring with you? Who do you want to say hello to? Who do you want to say hello to? Pick a thin pale card. The last of the original Bowling for Dollars shows died out by the early 90s. Having said that, there has been at least one attempt at rebooting the show. In 2013, Detroit's WADL launched a new edition of Bowling for Dollars, with original host Bob Allison returning as... Uh, the kingpin, at least for the pilot. In early 2014, numerous contestants and some crew members filed complaints with the station claiming that they'd never been paid. Some took legal action. And at the same time this happened, the show was conveniently dropped from the schedule. As of the making of this episode, the Bowling for Dollars concept appears to be dead and buried. Today's last concept is notable for being the first show, or more accurately, segment, to attempt to merge video games and broadcast television. This was known as TV Pal. Launched in 1978 by TV syndicator Marvin A. Kempner, TV Pow gave viewers a means of playing a video game over the phone. The original idea was that contestants would yell POW, which would trigger a Fairchild Channel F console, which had been fitted with voice activation hardware, to fire a shot at the game's target. As you could probably guess, lag was a constant problem. Pow. Too late! Pow. Too late! Too late! Pow. Too soon! Pow. Too late! Pow. Too late! Pow. John Godwin. He's eight years old in third grade at Kingsley Elementary School and got a little dog named Brownie. He says Brownie's a real pain in the neck. In 1979, just as the TV POW idea was gaining steam, Fairchild sold out to Zircon International, who wanted nothing to do with TV POW. However, within a matter of days, Marvin Kempner was able to get TV POW back in business thanks to toy maker Mattel. At the time, Mattel was developing their Intellivision console, which was rolled out nationally in 1980. Mattel offered Kempner a beta version of their upcoming console to not only get TV POW going again, but also to build anticipation for their new console. The most common Intellivision game used came from a compilation cartridge called Sharpshot, which was made up of four basic point-and-shoot games. Olympic 
part. Every afternoon, we put two buckaroos on the phone together and let them battle it out. Don't miss the excitement. Speed Racer, the Little Rascals, and Two Player Power, weekday afternoons at 4 here on Channel 31. You've got 30 seconds to play. Good luck and go. Cindy is 10 years old in the fifth grade at Chilhowie Elementary School. The dirty little secret about especially the Intellivision variant of TV POW was that there was often no voice activation. The game would usually be played by a TV station crew member reflexively hitting the fire button on the controller whenever the contestant yelled, POW! Keep going. POW! 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 <laughs> oh, no. Well, I think you were getting the hang of it, but that's all right. We'll put your car good back guess. in our little bit. Wrong guess, but that was a good guess. You and I are going to be playing for straight jackpot, okay? Thank you. Now, you know how to play the game? Yes, sir. All you have to do is make it read POW on the slot machine. I'm going to give you three chances at it, and remember, the machine stops automatically after a few seconds. Are you set? Right. Here we go. Good luck. POW. 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 Line up the letters now. From about 1980 to 82, TV POW was a rousing success, airing in some 80 American markets, as well as finding its way to Canada, England, Australia, the Philippines, Brazil, Italy, and a few others. At its peak, it was so popular that, in Salt Lake City, the phone company complained to local syndicate KSL-TV about TV POW, because it allowed potential contestants to call in. The incoming call volume was so great that it briefly caused seven states to lose phone access. This prompted most, if not all, versions of TV POW to go over to a dialing for dollars-esque outgoing calls only system. System, please, and everything that goes with everything you sure you want everything. I want everything. Now you get a new low price up to thirty dollars in rebate office and a free pack. Is man. that everything? It's not everything. You can get nearly three hundred different copies. Here in the U.S., the demise of TV POW seemed to inexplicably dovetail with the video game crash of 1983. But my best guess is that one too many kids yelled, "Pow! Pow! 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 pow into the receiver, causing the resident gamer at the TV station to not so mysteriously run over the game console with his car after hours one night. Anyway, TV POW had a little more life overseas, with the last confirmed instance occurring in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 1989, and Marvin Kempner's own unsubstantiated claim that it lasted until about 1991 in Italy. Okay, I admit, I was just kind of screwing around at the beginning of today's episode. But having said that, I recently was trying to get my own little reboot of the original Dialing for Dollars off the ground. Until I became the subject of a currently ongoing congressional investigation into breaking campaign finance laws. Because apparently the government can't tell the difference between giving money away and soliciting it. Idiots don't know their TV history. Anyway, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I turn the TV off for a while. Because I've burned through some serious brain cells making these last couple episodes. See you soon.
Cindy is 10 years old in the fifth grade at Chilhowie Elementary School. And she's playing for a TV Pal t-shirt and a KTEL Superstar game and a bag of Moore's potato chips. 